All right, uh, welcome to the 2023 Transfer Student Leadership Summit. My name is Jeff Mayo. Uh, I'm director of the first year experience at UT Austin, joined here by our panelists, presenters, and then my colleagues, um, Madeline Penn and Mandy Vashon uh, at UT Austin, also here with FYE. Um, we are thrilled to have a great turnout. You're still uh, filtering in through Zoom. Uh, for our first session. Um, I just wanted to briefly say, you know, thank you for joining us. This is our sixth Transfer Student Leadership Summit. We had our first one back in 2017. Um, it really started with the idea of after attending a conference with the National Institute for the Study of Transfer Students, NISTS, um, I know many of you have attended in the past, and if you haven't, I hope you get that opportunity. It's a great event each year. Um, after attending that, though, I realized, you know, the the folks really making a lot of change and are are some of the best advocates on our campus were the transfer students themselves, and I wanted to make um, something like a semi professional. Um, uh, conference summit professional development event available to students. And so we kind of worked to make something available through UT Austin. Our first three years of doing the event, they were offered um, as in-person events. So we largely had folks coming from across Texas, had about 40, 50 people at each of those. Uh, once COVID hit, we did move online and, you know, we have um, you know, for this session, we have 680 some odd folks signed up across the two sessions. And um, we're really excited to have, um, you know, have this reach where, you know, we love meeting in person and having really deep conversations about transfer in Texas, but the opportunity to work with students and staff from across the country is something that we're really excited about and that we can continue through this year. Um, and so really with that in mind, um, some of our objectives for this event is to spread some ideas and initiatives to new campuses. So you'll be hearing from our expert panelists about current trends and issues today, uh, and also about transfer transitions tomorrow, uh, as well as some student presenters, you know, talking about what they are doing as transfer student leaders themselves on their campuses. Maybe it sounds like something you can kind of plug and play that on your campus or it sparks a completely new idea. You know, we just hope to really, you know, spread some some ideas across across campuses. Uh, second, we want to amplify student voices. So um, that's a really important part of this is we hope that you'll be involved in the chat. Feel free to kind of introduce yourself and your your institution in the chat and um uh, maybe what your affiliation is with transfer. Uh, and then you'll be hearing later from Cam and then tomorrow with folks from Texas A&M about, um, you know, directly from our student leaders. So we're really excited to be able to amplify those voices. We want to build a proud and informed transfer peer network. You know, transfer is something that we really can build an identity around. And we want you all to be able to reach out to each other and connect over that shared experience. And then uh, finally, just have the experience of this supportive conference environment, the summit environment. You know, we're all here to learn from each other. I'm going to learn. Our staff is going to learn just alongside with y'all. Um, and by doing that, you know, we, we hope to have some points of more points of contact. So in the chat, you'll see some polls. We're hoping to learn from y'all as well. So uh, but at this point, I'm going to kick it over to Madeline with our team to kind of um, moderate the rest of the session. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, panelists. Uh, welcome, Cam. Welcome, everyone, to the room. Um, just wanted to remind you that in addition to the session today, we will also have a session tomorrow. I'll remind you again at the end, um, but that will be from 1 to 2.30 p.m. tomorrow also, Central Time, about transfer transitions. Um, and everything I'm about to tell you now is going to go for tomorrow as well. Um, but first, just briefly, some community agreements for how to engage during our summit today. Please keep your microphone muted unless you're speaking to reduce background noise. 
Um, if you would take a moment to make sure your name and your pronouns are correctly displayed for us. Um, just something to remember. Uh, together we know a lot. Alone we don't know it all. So we'd love to see you engaging in the chat. Um, like Jeff said, we are here to learn just as much as you. Um, and then please remember to create space for a range of experiences and viewpoints. Speak your truth and seek to understand others. Um, so again, if you want to use the chat to drop some questions for panelists, uh, please feel free. Some brief announcements before we get started as well. Um, we are going to have um, an Apple AirPods drawing. Um, you don't actually need to fill out anything uh, in the chat. What we're going to do instead is halfway through the session, we're going to take uh, the attendance list. And that is what we are going to put into our spinning wheel to draw for Apple AirPods at the end of the session. So the only thing there is you must be present at the end of the session to win. We apologize if you have a meeting and you've got to log off early, um, but this is the best way we can keep this as fair as possible um, given the constraints of time. So that will be happening at the end of our session. Um, additionally, please connect with us. You can use the hashtag transfer summit to look at previous transfer summits, um, connect with participants, also, if you follow We Are Transfer Nation on Instagram, you'll see related resources. So please um, engage with us in that way as well. And then finally, you're here. So hopefully you won't have technical support issues, but if you do, um, just please email us at tye at austin.utexas.edu. And with that, we'll move on to our final announcement which is when you RSVP, you might have signed up for one of our Transfer Summit workbooks. If this is the case, we will be mailing it out to you as soon as possible, but we will also be making a PDF available to everyone who registered. Um, we've found this Transfer Summit workbook to be a helpful way to plan out change on your campus. So hopefully you'll get a, a chance to look at that once it's out or in the PDF form. All right. So um, I'm gonna give a little bit of context since this session is about transfer trends and issues. And then I'm going to let the real experts speak to what they know about some of these issues. Um, so first, um, since the onset of the pandemic, transfer enrollment has continued to decline overall. Um, transfers numbers dropped by 9% nationally. The first year of the pandemic, uh, by the second year, 5% more. And this continued decline took many people by surprise but it looks like much of the overall transfer decline is a result of community college enrollment drops. Um, notably, students over the age of 20 count for more than 85% of this two-year decline in transfer transition. Uh, additionally, um, this past fall, transfers between community colleges and four-year institutions, so it's called upward transfer, continued to drop by 7.5% according to the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center. So this fact suggests that upward transfer um, continuing to decline suggests that baccalaureate attainment is beginning to appear increasingly out of reach for some community college students. Um, and research shows that this is particularly true for students enrolled in urban and suburban co community colleges. They saw steeper declines in transfer than community colleges in towns or rural areas. Um, likewise, students from low income backgrounds are experiencing the drop of transfer at a higher rate than more socioeconomically uh, advantaged peers. So clearly the issue of who the systems of transfer do not serve as effectively um, are up for question. Um, and a lot of the inequalities that the pandemic revealed um, are likewise being shown in transfer rates. Um, with a nod toward the future, um, we should keep in mind that incoming classes who were in middle and high school when the pandemic began um, and who struggled to learn during the pandemic will be coming into college in subsequent years. Um, and so that's sort of something that we may want to be keeping an eye on toward the future um, as they might be coming in with greater needs to the transfer process as well. Finally, the pandemic exacerbated problems that have already plagued the transfer community for years. Um, like tracking down transcripts and getting credits transferred from the previous institution. Um, however, as we all know, it's not just about getting transfer students through the door. Um, colleges also uh, need to make sure students' basic needs are met, especially now. 
um, so that they have academic and financial support that they need once they transfer in order to stay enrolled. So that's just a little bit of the context that we're coming in with. Um, let me go ahead and introduce our panelists and we will ask them a couple of questions about the transfer trends and issues they are currently researching. Um, so first we have John Fink. He's the Senior Research Associate and Program Lead for the Community College Research Center at Teachers College, Columbia University. John's research focuses on learner transitions between educational sectors with the goal of eliminating barriers that result in unequal access to opportunities for low-income first-generation and students of color. He has led national research on community college transfer outcomes and disparities. And prior to joining the CCRC, John advised community college transfer students at the University of Maryland. So welcome, John. We are thrilled you're here with us. And then I'd also like to introduce Armando Lizarraga. He is a doctoral student at the University of Texas at Austin, hook him. Um, he's a native of Inglewood, California and a current, uh, a current doctoral student at UT. Um, he's currently a graduate research assistant for Project Males and an instructor for the Texas Prison Education Initiative. He earned his uh, Associate of Arts in General Studies from El Camino College, a BA in Chicano Chicana Studies and, a socio and Sociology from UCLA, and his Master of Arts in Higher and Post-Secondary Education from Teachers College, Columbia University. So there's that connection there as well. Um, We're thrilled to have you with us today. All right, so my first question uh, is to the both of you, which is how did you get into transfer? Well, I, I can jump in. Hey, everybody, good to be here. Yeah, Transfer Summit. Um, thank you for the invitation. Good to be talking with you all about transfer research. Transfers are the best students. I got into transfer. I was working at the University of Maryland. Shout out to the Terps on the call. I see a couple of folks here. And I was in the in student affairs in the um, in the student union. And our uh, student union director and the board, uh, the student board who ran the union oversaw it, recognized that transfer students were really just being le left behind and left out of a lot of important co-curricular and extracurricular activities like leadership development, multicultural uh, education, cross-cultural learning, and um, really sort of invested in creating a program and a pipeline for more transfer students to get connected to those important enriching experiences outside the classroom. And and um, I, so we, you know, we, we, we started that out. We, you know, worked with, with uh, students to get them more support and connected to, to programs. But I, uh, you know, kept on hearing from those students just how the credit transfer issue was just like this big elephant in the room. And they were taking this, these courses and participating in this experience because they were having to like retake a bunch of courses for a semester and were like in a hover, you know, holding pattern. Um, because that B they got in calculus at the community college wasn't enough to get them into the business program or so, you know, th which now I know is like pretty unfortunately common. Um, and so that really got me like really fired up about research for advocacy with a national um, sort of lens to really drive states and, and university and college leaders to really um, create a better system for transfer students. For me, wow. Um, so how to get into transfer? I mean, I am a transfer, right? So I I went through the pipeline. Um, I went to El Camino. Um, but when I was there, I went right out of high school. So right out of high school, I went to El Camino for two years. My trajectory is really interesting just because after two years, I felt that education was not for me. Um, I, I received a lot of that messaging throughout my K through 12 so then I left to join the workforce, came back 10 years later, and um, I, I just got really deep, deeply involved in my studies as far as, um, you know, just giving education a chance. And so as I started navigating, you know, my community college, I got introduced to a mentoring program, um, the Center for Community College Partnerships at UCLA, shout out to them. Um, who really mentored me and kind of guided me through, you know, the pipeline. And, and I think it was through learning about the pipeline, I, I identified and I saw not only, you know, the cracks within the pipeline, but, um, you know, I was seeing it, but also I was experiencing it myself, right? And, and I think that's kind of what got me 
into doing transfer work um, or the intersections of community colleges, the transfer pipeline, and how to advocate for more um, awareness for transfer students, just because, like John said, bias, right? Uh, transfers do it best. Um, we're more engaged. I think there's more of an awareness, um, a resiliency that comes with being a transfer student. There's so much to us. Um, we're not just a monolith. You know, there's a lot of things that, there's a lot of strengths. I'm going to jump right off of what you were saying about mentorship, Armando, and ask you another question. Um, also, just want to put out there, also a proud transfer myself. Um, so, uh, happy to be a part of, of that community too. Um, so Armando, you're currently a graduate research assistant for Project Males, and a core tenet of Project Males is that culturally relevant mentoring can advance Latino males and, more broadly, students of color toward degree attainment. Um, you are also a peer mentor for UCLA, the Center for Community College Partnerships that you gave a shout out for. Um, and so we're wondering what role you believe peer mentoring plays in transfer student success? I think it's critical, um, extremely critical. Um, I think even now in my graduate studies, mentoring and femtoring is still a part of, you know, my trajectory, it doesn't stop. Um, but I think when it comes to community colleges specifically, um, when I was being mentored, I had a mentor who was already at UCLA, right? So I think they made it a little bit more realistic for me. And I think that's kind of why I believe that it's really, really a critical part of um, of the transfer process or just like, you know, advancing transfer student successes. Because um, a lot of students, in my experience, when I mentored, even formally and informally, I hear a lot of um, them, a lot of pushback of like, oh, I can't do that or that's not me. And a lot of that was the language that I used to to push back, right? I was just like, oh, that's not for me. You know, I had a professor who was the one that really pushed me to consider UCLA as a as a transfer option. And my response initially to her when she told me that I should consider UCLA, I was just like, that's not for me. Like, and she was like, what do you mean? I was like, well, people like me don't go there, right? So I think when you have a mentor who's on the other side who looks like you, who speaks like you, who dresses like you, um, it really just kind of makes you envision that as a possibility. Um, or even just to think, right? Because I, I know that when I saw that, I was just like, oh, wow, like me, I could be there. So I think it plays a really big, big role. Um, and especially just kind of knowing that that is an, an issue or a thing. It's kind of like, how do you affirm students, right? How do you validate those experiences to let them know that, hey, you're bringing in all this to this institution and guess what? It's appreciative, it's welcome. Um, and just kind of capitalize off of that, I think, has been really, really, really foundational to like mentoring and mentoring uh, informally and formally. Thank you so much. Um, my next question is for both of you again. Um, much of the discussion around transfer trends and issues has been impacted as I said before, by the pandemic and the inequalities that it's exacerbated. Um, we're wondering what transfer issue or issues have been at the top of your mind lately in 2022, 2023. Yeah, I mean, I'll just jump off what Armando was talking about, like the importance of mentoring and like how valuable just that one interaction can be. It can really turn things around. And what we've learned in our research is that like what colleges do and with their university partners, like what uh, educators do um, and advisors do and instructors do, it really matters. It can make a big difference. Um, we, you know, our system isn't working as well as it should or needs to, but what we see is there's a lot of variation and, you know, some places are doing, are, have intentional practices to provide, you know, high quality mentoring, relevant, culturally relevant experiences. And I think like the, the Center for Community College Partnerships is just a great example of that, but there's lots of great work happening out there. And it's really important the work that, that um, you know, all of you are doing in this space. And um, something that's been on my mind is just, you know, even before the pandemic, community college enrollments were, you know, dropping almost to record lows, especially among older adults. And then with the pandemic, it, you know, further, you know, dropped off a cliff. And I think there just is a general questioning of the value um, of higher education. 
Um, and, you know, to, to some extent, we know that, you know, bachelor's degrees are and graduate degrees are the degrees uh, that are going to lead to high paying good jobs in, in the information economy. On the other hand, it's sort of like, well, can you blame students that are coming in and, you know, it's a very unclear path with not a lot of support. Students are not getting the mentoring. They're sort of self-advising. They're doing a DIY transfer degree that's pretty generic and not really aligned to something like that's tangible. And I think our system is set up um, based on funding and resources and, you know, to, to do that. And so I, I think what's on my mind is, you know, not just how are we going to build back um, enrollments for colleges and university partners, but how are we going to build back college access and um, a real confidence in what a transfer pathway can take and can take students to in terms of further opportunity? So that's really been top of mind for me. For me, um, something that's been very, very, you know, it sits in my head every day, basically, um, is the re-implementation of Pell Grants to incarcerated students. Um, again, I teach in a correctional facility now, and um, I think of the fact that they're, you know, nationwide, nationally, about 610,000 uh, 600, 610, people get released from, you know, correctional facilities a year. And, you know, when I, when we hunted down to Texas specifically, you know, about 78,000 of folks from are released from incarcerated uh, facilities. But on the flip side of that, you know, data has shown that about like 1,700 folks participate in uh, prison education programs. And a lot of these programs are supported by community colleges, right? So I, I think of how does this look like? Um, come July 1st. So July 1st is when it gets re-implemented. And I know it's not going to be a light switch where it's just like, okay, July 1st, everybody has access now, right? It's a process. But I I, I think of my students, right, of when they tell me I, once I get out or once I get paroled, I, I want to continue. But then I wonder if institutions, not just in Texas, but across the country, are prepared to support incar formerly incarcerated students you know, are there resources? Are there, is there programming? Um, is there a transition? Is there a handoff? Um, so that's something that I think about a lot, uh, a lot, just because I, I, I've been teaching since August and I've had three students already parole and all three of them express that they want to continue at the community college. Um, so I think of that, I think of the visibility of them and you know, the stigma, right, of like self-disclosing that they have a, a record. Um, and, you know, it just, you know, how do we respond to that? How do institutions respond to that? So that's something that I think about daily, honestly. Absolutely. Um, I just saw a question in the chat. Um, okay, so the question in the chat actually relates to the question I was going to ask next, um, which had to do uh, with John, your work and your study on um, inequitable access to education and economic opportunity um, for racially minoritized low income and first generation students. And Armando, the work that you were just referencing um, with students who are who are coming out on uh, out of incarceration who want to continue at community colleges. Um, I was going to ask what are some of the unique needs and challenges, which Armando, you've already gone into somewhat, um, faced by transfer students from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, but if you could speak more to how colleges and universities could better support these students. And then what was put in the chat is actually um, somebody, uh, Michael asked any thoughts on mental health or counseling services uh, that might be needed by students as they are going through the transfer pipeline. So I think that actually relates um, to uh, how colleges and universities might better support these students. So if you could speak to that. I'll go. I wasn't sure if you were, oh, go ahead, John. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you're just. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, good. I'm sorry, we were like playing a little uh, stand up here. Um, I was cu so curious what you had to say, Armando, but um, I mean, what, you know, what we've learned um, in terms of specific, you know, just knowing that 
you know, transfer is important because it is this pathway, like, you know, to upward mobility and sort of greater education, bachelor's and graduate degrees for um, populations that are underrepresented when you look at, you know, who has a bachelor's or graduate degree. So Black and Latino, uh, first generation, a whole, you know, informally incarcerated. So we, there's all these like different groups that, um, you know, have not been well served by our higher education system and transfer is a potential to sort of, um, you know, bridge um, the, the gaps. But what we also see is that, you know, on the whole, it's not working well. Although I should say that, you know, there really are bright spots out there. And that's where our research is focused on what can we learn from places that, that are doing better. Um, and when we think about, you know, you know, racially minoritized students, other groups from, you um, underrepresented backgrounds, you know, we think about sort of systemic issues, um, like that our higher ed system, like I mentioned before, is sort of set up around this, like, you know, the myth of the transfer meritocracy, that if students, you know, students just need to figure this out, like, it's not that complicated, but actually, it is really complicated. And if you're going to try to interpret articulation agreements, one study found you need like a, J, uh, like a, a law degree. Um, and so I think just the way that we've set up the systems, um, you know, creates this hidden curriculum. And so I think what we see, uh, you know, part, transfer partnerships working on is how are we going to design something where the defaults are a seamless transfer experience, build in, you know, um, uh, you know, early pre-transfer advising so that right now the system typically is, okay, if you're about to graduate with your associates, go visit the transfer office and see where you want to apply. Well, that's like oftentimes just too late in the process. And the four years are just not typically in many cases, not all, a part of that conversation yet. And so what we see much more is this collective impact approach with four years community colleges and more and more high schools in K-12 um, with the expansion of high school students taking community college courses and sort of being by default um, transfer students that sort of collective impact and really focusing on um, priority groups that, are, that have been historically left behind by this system. And then when you sort of you know that that gets to the more of the cultural and the the pieces around that have that have sort of been discriminatory in the past, like um, you know stigmatization of community colleges and the sort of receptive cultures. And um, there's been I think great examples of what that has looked like. And I think it's a vote of confidence here that just folks are really focusing on this piece. And I'll bring it um, just one more point on on the you know the real importance of attending to mental wellness among students, um, especially sort of coming out of the pandemic. This is really up there, something that we're hearing across all, all you know, college and universities that we speak with. And I think we can uh, a tie in here. There's, of course, mental health counseling and those resources that that um, can be made available to students. But in general, like we all need support. You know, we all need our mental wellness to be attended to, especially transfer students, especially coming out of the pandemic. And so I think um, there's a real uh, uh, important connection that we see connecting into belonging and just what is what does belonging look like on our campus for everyone to feel like they have a place, they have caring, um, you know, folks on their campus, peers or, or sort of practitioners, and um, that being built in into um, the classroom, into co-curricular programming um, to really uh, advance mental wellness in addition to uh, addressing um, mental health needs through traditional forms like a counseling center. I think going off of what John was saying, um, a study that, uh, shout out to Dr. Melissa Beta, who's on the call now, but a study that she and I did um, you know, we just kind of did a landscape analysis of just, again, specifically to Texas um, and seeing the types of services that pertain to like incarcerated students or formerly incarcerated students. And we did that because we know that obviously the access point to higher ed for most students who were formerly incarcerated is a community college. Um, and we were able to, we saw that there was not that much language available like on websites or on any of the institutions um, for any type of support, um, you know, resources in general. And I think a point that when Dr. Melissa Rita and I were, you know, coming with findings is that typically for someone who's incarcerated, their family members are gonna be the ones that are gonna be researching this information for them. The, the access to internet when you're incarcerated is really limited. So if somebody wants to continue on once they get out, they're depending on someone on the outside to get them that information. And if there's no language or any type of information resources 
uh, that are specific to someone who was formerly incarcerated, then how do how can they continue? How do they make that transition in? Um, so that's something that I that I think institutions could be doing a little bit better um, when it comes to supporting underrepresented students. Um, just because you know information is key, um, specifically if you're trying to transition, um, you know, back into the community and back with your family, and education is obviously, you know, something that they want to pursue. Then, is you know that information should be somewhat available and visible. I mean, you, you don't have to go through hoops to find this information, right? We, there's a financial aid tab, you know, and if or some something, right? Absolutely. Thank you both for those answers. We've got a lot of people sharing resources and links in the chat as well. Um, so thank you for, for everyone for sharing what you know on those topics. Um, John, the next question I have is for you. Um, you you co-authored the transfer playbook detailing the essential practices of high-performing transfer partnerships. Can you tell us about some of these key practices and where you've seen them put into action um, and maybe this can connect to everything we've been saying before, but um, through, though your work is, sorry, though your work focuses on policy, we're also wondering what role students might play in building these high performing transfer partnerships, as we have a number of transfer student leaders on this call as well. Right on. Um, so what, when my first project that I worked on when I came uh, just from the University of Maryland working with transfer students was this um, par partnership with the National Student Clearinghouse and Aspen Institute to, you know, first off, we wanted to sort of create some more sort of uh, motivation for let's let's try to fix transfer. Well, um, you know, oftentimes I think maybe folks didn't really have good data on how well the transfer system was working, but this project first sort of looked at this national a data set of all students who entered community college and what happened six years later. And we found that only about a third of students ever transferred um, and only about like 14% of students completed a bachelor's. So the system overall was really underperforming. Um, but as a follow-up to that, and I think that that piece was important to sort of get some pressure, you know, from the outside on institutions to, you know, think about, well, what's going on? Whereas to, to your question, the student uh, voice is, I think, just as if not more important than that external pressure, it's that internal bottom up pressure. Like you all are the consumers, you are the, you all are voting with your tuition feet and you uh, can have a lot of sway in, in making an, an impact. And I think it, we have to push from all of these sides. Um, but in that, in that study, um, you know, we saw that these these outcomes were very low overall, but we did see that there were some in particular partnerships with stronger results. And so we visited them with the Aspen Institute and just like asked them, what do you think, you know, explains your stronger outcomes? And we basically, there are a bunch of practices listed in there, but it kind of came down to a, a few things. First, the, the, the leaders of the institution. So, you know, folks doing the work, they sort of knew the challenges in and out, um, you know, the transfer advisors, the, you know, the credit articulation folks, but it it was really the leaders at those colleges, um, the presidents, the deans, the provosts, um, they, they valued transfer students. They saw it as an institutional priority that it was in their best interest to serve transfer students well and to invest in that. Um, and that sort of led to a variety of investments in advising and sort of bringing academic departments together to make transfer, um, you know, connecting transfer students to important experiences outside the classroom and mentoring, et cetera. Um, so, but it, it was really just a prioritization of transfer students. And um, I think what, what we've seen since is that there, before you saw these leaders, they had this like enlightened self-interest to focus on transfer students because it was the right thing to do, but they also knew that it was important for their college, for the business of their college. And I think that that, the conditions have, you know, are hopefully uh, be becoming even more enabling for a better transfer programs because, uh, you know, community colleges and, and four years are really feeling the declines in enrollments. And to some extent, uh, four-year institutions and even community colleges have taken transfer students for granted and really need to sort of, you know, make Make better investments in in supporting uh, transfer students. So I'm I'm sort of it, I think it's a tough it, it is challenging out there right now. Just what we're hearing from folks, but I'm also I'm hopeful because uh, you know I'm hopeful that with the student voice and advocacy and with some external pressure on the system, we can get leaders to invest and prioritize in transfer student success. Thank you so much. Um, Going to quick, ch quickly check the chat. 
um, just because I want to see if there are any other questions coming in. Okay. Um, I have a question for both of you from, for right now, um, which is more on the local level. Uh, what would you recommend um, student leaders and staff, so we're talking about that internal pressure, right? Um, consider advocating for certain campus policies or adopting best practices that prioritize transfer student success. So basically, which one, if we're talking about, is there one to, to think about first? Um, would that be advocating for campus policy or getting people to adopt best practices that prioritize student success? Or can you separate the two? I can, uh, a couple ideas came to mind right away. First, I think just showing folks off it, like revealing the numbers, like the, what is the size of the transfer population? It seems kind of basic, but a lot of folks don't know, like you, you know, faculty and departments, deans, like they're not, they're not unfortunately thinking about it, but just like a lot of colleges, it's like half the students, a lot of universities, half the students are transfer students. Um, and, you know, well, where are they coming from? Well, this big community college that's next door. Well, to what extent are we, is this just one person doing all the outreach for like half of our student population? So I think like put, painting that picture of like, how many students do we have and how many staff do we have serving those students? And does that seem right? Um, uh, you know, you can get that information a lot of times on website, on your university websites, but also just asking the institutional research office or doing like a FOIA request. Just, you know, let's get, let's sh shed some light on this. The other thing uh, my students at University of Maryland did that I thought was really smart was they did like a policy audit of like various organizations, like in the bylaws. Um, like, uh, because I think they had heard, I couldn't remember if it was at the university or another one that like, you couldn't be student government president if you were a transfer student, just like categorically. I, I'm not saying that that was the case at the university, I can't remember, but things like that, that are just sort of subtly or explicitly exclusionary, like undergraduate research programs. Well, the, the professors tend to not wanna work with transfer students because they only have two years to work with them instead of all four. Like kind of, you know, things that, you know, kind of those more like auditing of the experience and who's not getting, a, even if you're there, access to the full benefits of being at the university, I think is, is just a, seems like important work to be done. For me, I think when it comes to best practices, and I'll touch up upon campus policies too, but one thing that comes to mind when I think of best practices, I think institutions, most of them that I've experienced, very talk about students in a very traditional uh, language, um, like, oh, yeah, we appreciate, you know, our our freshmen, but it's never inclusive of transfer students. Um, and I, I think that in itself is, I, I would say it's problematic, because I, I know I've had situations where I'm just like, well, I'm here, like, I'm not a, I'm not a traditional student, right? Um, you know, I came to the community college, so I think being inclusive, right, of, of language, right, being intentional of like, hey, you know, we have transfer students, recognize them, uh, make them visible. And I think it kind of goes to like what John was saying is like, bringing awareness to the institution, right, making sure that faculty, deans, programming, you know, that, you know, that there's transfer students and transfer students have different needs. Uh, they're not your typical traditional student, right? Um, so I think that's really important. Um, I think when it comes to policies, um, there's something that I experienced in my undergrad is that a lot of the classroom, the class the classes that were offered were very much offered in a very traditional time, uh, a very eight to five kind of um, time. And I think it would be interesting to to assess, right, if if evening classes were to be offered, if students would be more engaged. And I'm talking about this more on the four year level. Because I know at the community college level, you know, classes are kind of like nonstop around the clock, right? But I think about it at the four year, it's like, again, kind of feeding into like this transfer receptive culture, right? Is our institutions catering to that commuter student, to that parenting student? Um, you know, how, how can we change maybe a class schedule to be inclusive of like evening courses um, and not just thinking of classes, you know, between eight and five? That's something yeah. that just comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, we had a non-traditional student panel in the fall, and there was a lot of conversation about 
the times of classes and how you can work that around childcare. Um, exactly. So, yeah, that, that resonates. Absolutely. Um, it looks like we only have about five minutes left, um, but I have one more question for both of you, um, which is sort of particularly for our transfer student leaders. Um, so in our transfer year experience office, um, we are often in awe of the changes that transfers have brought to this community um, and to their prospective campuses. And so we're wondering if you have any parting words for our transfer student leaders who are watching today um, or who will watch this recording, who are inspired to bring about change on their campuses, um, but may see something as a challenge that is too daunting to take on. I think it's fine community. I, I think one of the, I mean, I'm from California, right? So uh, me being in Texas, it's been hard to find community or to find folks who are kind of doing this work, right? But I think they're out there. And I think once you put yourself out there, you know, the work kind of speaks for itself and people are going to start reaching out and then that's how you start building your community. So I think definitely, definitely continue. Um, at least in my case, I've, I started off really, I guess, lonely in the sense that like, you know, trying to find, you know, community who's doing what and who's, you know, folks and things like that. But I think once you put yourself out there and the work is being done, people find you and you find them. And I think, so I think don't get discouraged if it seems like if it's a lonely process or you're not finding the right people, people will find you and you will find people. And I think there's a big impact when you do things, you know, in numbers, right? When it's just not just you. Um, and I think that's even relevant to like the work that I'm doing now, you know, with prison education programs. Initially, when I came on board, trying to find someone doing that, I, I was just kind of like, well, where do I find folks? And then now I was able to build community and find folks that are doing that type of work. So I, I, all that to say is like, just be, be hopeful and be and sometimes the community doesn't have to be at your institution that's another thing too some of my biggest supporters are at different institutions and we just kind of meet up on zoom and and strategize and like okay how can i help you at your institution and how can you help me here um so just think outside the box too i would say especially in the age of zoom thank you so much armando um john any, any parting words that's such good advice, Armando, like the community, like just to kind of sustain yourselves through this important work. Um, I would just underline that and also just say this is important work. You know, the transfer students are like basically nearly a majority in higher ed. Uh, if you just look at just the experience and, you know, half of bachelor's degrees go to folks who are transfer students. 20% um, of master's degrees and 10% of PhDs go to folks who started at community college. Um, so we're, you know, y'all are out there, uh, you know, to, there is community, got to find it. Um, you know, we need more attention on this and we need more attention at these transition points. Um, transfer students are like experts at transitions and life is full of transitions and our education system is full of transitions too. And, you know, it's at those transitions points that we see the most um, sort of inequity play out in the stratification. And that's also where the biggest opportunity is to increase equity and, and opportunity for all students. Um, and so I think really, you know, transitions are important to focus on. This work is really valuable. Students have, I think, the most powerful voice. Um, when you get folks into the room, we can talk about all these numbers and everything, but it really is the students, um, you know, that can that can sort of speak and bring that power um, to the leaders of, of these college universities, because um, ultimately they're there to serve the students. So um, find your community and, and keep pushing. Thank you both so very much. This has been such a wonderful discussion as evidenced by everybody who's been in, participating in the chat. So thank you everyone for your shout outs and your resources and your sharing your experiences. We appreciate it so much. Um, and now we're gonna transition over to, speaking of student voice and student leadership, um, a student presenter. So we're going to now turn it over to here we go, Cam Uzel. Uh, he's at the University of Miami Herbert Business School. 
I'm going to be turning over the presentation to him as well. So he's going to be sharing his presentation with a couple of polls for y'all. Um, so without further ado, Cam, um, I'll let you introduce yourself, give us a little background on your transfer story and take it away. Great. Thank you so much. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Oops. All right. So hopefully everyone can see that. Okay. Um, so my name is Cami Zell, um, and this presentation is called Strategic Execution, a Data-Driven Approach to Creating a Successful Transfer Community. So a little bit about me, um, I, I'm a junior right now at the University of Miami, studying in the Herbert Business School. I um, originally came from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, so I started um, my freshman year there in 2020. Um, during the, you know, the pandemic, um, you know, and so the school was, you know, a great school, just not the right fit for me. And so when I came to the University of Miami, I felt I was able to get involved in a lot more opportunities, but specifically, um, I got involved in the transfer community and specifically kind of uh, took more of a leadership role um, in that community. So um, I became the president of Tau Sigma National Honor Society at the University of Miami's chapter. And so, you know, a lot of these examples that you'll see throughout this presentation are going to be, um, you know, they're going to have some sort of Tau Sigma related aspect to it. However, everything I'm presenting is transferable to, you know, any initiative group or um, really kind of any event that's promoting um, the prosperity of transfer students. And that's Tau Sigma is housed uh, directly, you know, under the, the orientation commuter student involvement office, their department at the University of Miami. And then I'm also a part of the transfer student organization, which is a University of Miami specific um, student, fully student run organization um, that they kind of promote, um, again, the prosperity of transfer students and um, create various initiatives to uh, support the growth of transfers at the university. So, uh, when I stepped into my role as um, president of Tau Sigma, I noticed that there were um, there were there were three main challenges, and and I kind of um, you know grouped them in in this sense: low engagement, distant community, and really no long term mission for the growth of transfer students. And um, so I'm going to uh, put a poll in the chat right now, and I'm I'm just curious um, which one of these three, if any, resonate. Um, <clears throat> resonate with you. Let's see if I can put this in. So I see a lot of, of low engagement and I see you guys are answering uh, my other two questions, which is good. I'll get to those later in the presentation. But um, the, the biggest one is, is low engagement. Um, and so that's actually um, the, the one that I'm going to be focusing on for this presentation, because um, that was the biggest thing that, that was such a shock to me is that, you know, within the transfer community, there is really um, no, no, there's no sense of urgency and there's really um, you know, a lack of engagement with students participating in various transfer initiatives on campus. So I'm going to go ahead and, and end this poll for now. <clears throat> and so um, I, you know, the presentation being, you know, creating a successful transfer community, I, I want to first define, you know, how is success measured, right? And for me, um, it's success is really built by metric. And, and what I mean by that is I've selected the metric of um, low engagement, and I said, okay, well, how can I turn this into high engagement and in turn create success? And so um, success for me in, in this sense is going to be high engagement. Specifically, um, I wanted an 80% show rate on um, my various events that I held throughout the semester. And so I can break this metric down even further by creating three kind of subcategories um, of, of how I'm going to achieve this high engagement. And uh, the first one is one effective newsletter campaigns. I also want strong campus presence. 
And I want to develop an extended online network so that the transfer community that I'm building on campus can stay with us, kind of solidify and carry on um, for alumni of the university that are transfer students um, to keep the entire community connected post you know, graduation. And so the first thing I'm going to talk about is a data driven approach to newsletter campaigns. Um, so going back to the poll, I, I see that um, a lot of you guys uh, use newsletters for your transfer community, um, but a lot of you don't as well. And so um, hopefully you'll be able to implement this, whether you are a, a student leader or whether you're a faculty member, um, hopefully you'll be able to implement some of um, some of these newsletter techniques. So <clears throat> I use MailChimp for my newsletters, and I like MailChimp for a couple of reasons. This is kind of the the um, the face of MailChimp, and you can see as we scroll down, I have a bunch of different newsletters that I send out to my my transfer community each month. Um, but you can also utilize MailChimp to create you know various automated uh, drip campaigns, landing pages, ads social media posts and surveys as well. They also have a contact section, which, a lot, which allows you to easily import all of your contacts, all the transfer student contacts, but also most importantly, create tags. So these tags are important because it allows you to specifically target your newsletter depending on uh, you know, what type of, of student you're targeting. So you can see I have PNM tags, which stands for potential new members. And this is for Tau Sigma. And I also have inducted member tags. So my monthly newsletters are going to look a little bit different if I'm sending them to inducted members or if I'm sending them to potential new members who I want to recruit, who I want to kind of um, come out to different information sessions, come out to different initiative sessions. Um, and so this is a really helpful feature to really let you hone in on who you're targeting and make sure that you're, you know, using effective marketing tactics um, for that for that group. The other nice thing about MailChimp is that you're able to actually look at metrics automatically populating um, for MailChimp. So this is an example of three metrics that I've selected. We've got total open, we've got clicks per unique open, and then we've got forwarding. All right, so this is the, the latest newsletter that I sent out to, uh, to my group of transfer students, the April events newsletter. And you can see that um, out of the, the total amount of students that I've sent to, 101 opened that email. Um, and these are 101 unique opens, right? Um, so once a student opens, it stops tracking. We also have clicks per unique open, and this is measured as the percentage of unique subscribers who clicked on one or more links in the campaign. So this number, I usually aim for about 45 to 50%. So for April, it is looking a little bit low at 22.8%, but this is basically, you know, how many students are interacting with, with the newsletter. And that's through clicking on um, links to, you know, learn more about different events. Um, you know, if I put an, an article about a new initiative that has been implemented for transfer students, how many people are engaging with that newsletter and clicking on it? And then I always like to look at forwarded because I feel like this is the the, the peak. If if a student is forwarding your newsletter to a friend, um, it, they must be they must be um you know really enjoying its content. All right. So this month I only had two forwarded. Um, but this just shows that transfer students or you know your recipients are engaging with the newsletter, sending it out, kind of sharing it. And um, there are a bunch of other metrics that um, might be more relevant to you and to the the goals that you're achieve you're trying to achieve. Um, and that's all free included in MailChimp. We can also break it down even further uh, by looking at the top links clicked. So each of these links represent um, a different event that I had in the newsletter or a different initiative um, that I wanted someone to click on to read more about. And from this, I can I can look at uh, you know, who's engaging in what, and I can see, okay, well, this event, this was actually for um, a, a sports uh, transfer initiative that we had, and we had um, the majority of students clicking on this one. So that tells me, you know, as a student leader, I need to implement more activities like this because this is what's getting my engagement, right? Whereas something like, like this link at the bottom, which was for another event, got zero engagement. And so by utilizing these metrics, I can figure out what events are working, what events I can completely remove, um, and then I can better, you know, better tailor to, you know, the, the wants and, and desires of, of um, that group of people. I also like to look at um, tracking the 24 hour performance of the, the newsletter. And uh, this is important because it really matters when you're sending out newsletter campaigns, it really matters uh, when the newsletter is going out because that's gonna play a role in how many students are going to be engaging with the newsletter. So 
if you look over here, I've got, um, you know, I, I sent the newsletter out at 10 a.m. And you can see uh, the, the, the orange line represents the amount of students that open the newsletter. And uh, the purple line represents the clicks. And again, these are unique clicks. So once a student clicks open uh, or clicks on, on something in the newsletter, it stops counting it. So you can see that even though there are a ton of opens at 10 a.m., there is still a substantial gap between uh, the amount of people that open the newsletter and the amount of people that actually clicked on, um, on any content in the newsletter. But then if you look over here at 2 p.m., you see a little bit of a change where the amount of clicks is actually greater than the amount of opens. And what that tells me is that, you know, at 10 a.m., students are opening the newsletter. Uh, students are, are looking at them, but they're not actually clicking. They might be, you know, um, it might be a busy time for classes or they might just be quickly browsing their email. But it's not until later in the afternoon at 2 p.m. when they're actually going back into the newsletter and actually exploring it and clicking on the links and engaging with it. And ideally, what you want is you want the opens to um, be way more lined up with the, the clicks. And you can think of this as kind of when you're shopping in a grocery store and uh, you're what you're in the checkout aisle and you see, you know, there's gum, there's chocolate. These are impulse buys, right? They're only buys that, that you know, you're, you're purchasing them because they're convenient because they're right there and they look good and they're easy to purchase. They're cheap. Okay. And I, I like to look at my newsletter campaigns in the same way. When you, when you, when you, when someone opens a newsletter, that's the best time that you want them to engage with it right then and there when it's fresh, because what happens otherwise is that a student might open a newsletter and then kind of forget about it. And then it kind of goes away. So you want to catch them at the right time. You want the newsletter to strategically be sent out at the right time when one, they're going to open it, but also have the time to engage with it and click on links and RSVP to events. <clears throat> So let me go ahead and erase that. So next I wanna transition into uh, what makes a strong campus presence. And so uh, I asked a, a question in the poll and, uh, and that was, um, do you partner with other communities on or off campus? I'm actually gonna see if I can share, share these results. Um, and so it looks like the majority, um, the majority do partner with communities on or off campus. And I'm going to talk about why that's important and how I've kind of utilized um, partnerships with, with Tau Sigma. Um, and so there are three kind of prongs I want to break, break it into. And this is all to kind of boost presence on, on campus. And um, in the, in the, uh, panelists q and I know they were talking about this a little bit, but it's it's so important to um, have a strong presence as a, as a transfer community on campus. And that might be, you know, student leaders, transfer student leaders, or that might be faculty members, um, you know, coming out with different initiatives for transfer students. But you want transfer students to feel like there is a place for them on campus, that they have a voice on campus. And, um, and, and the best way to do that is just to boost presence within the transfer community. So one of the best ways I like to do this is uh, is through tabling events. Um, and so we most recently, I mo we most recently had transfer day at the University of Miami, and uh, we did um, you know an Einstein bagel and coffee free for transfer students to come and get some coffee, get some bagels. Um, but at every single tabling event I, I I have, I'm also using it to collect data, and I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. The other thing we have is partnerships with campus organizations. So one big issue that I've found at my institution is that transfer students and, and commuter students, a lot of our commuter students are, are also transfer students um, coming in from the, the Miami-Dade Community College. Um, they tend to stick kind of with their people, right? Transfer students stick with transfer students. And one of my goals was to kind of expand their reach, to kind of diversify their experience on campus. And I was able to create partnerships uh, with, with various other student-run organizations on campus. So um, one big one is our, our cooking club. So we actually partnered recently with our cooking club on campus, and we cook meals for um, a local food shelter. So one, you're allowing students to kind of um, get to know other you know, non-transfer students at, the, you know, at your university, um, but you're also doing good for the community, engaging them um, with, their, with their community outside of the particular institution. 
And then there's also off-campus volunteering events. So um, as part of Tau Sigma, we, um, we actually require students, active members in the society to, um, to do some sort of volunteer experience, fulfill one sort of volunteer experience uh, per semester. And um, we most recently partnered um, with the American Red Cross organization. And um, we have like a local food shelter that we go to and we actually bring students to the food shelter to kind of help out and do some volunteer work there. Um, and this is a great way to kind of engage transfer students. One, kind of force them, you know, quote unquote, force them to kind of come together, but also do good for the community. So going back to these tabling events, um, you know, this presentation is about a, more of a data-driven approach. And so um, there's always, always, always a way to collect data um, through tabling events, which is why I love them so much. And what I use is uh, I use Qualtrics. And um, I know that there's, there's a ton of different softwares for, for you know, data collection, for creating surveys, um, and they all do similar things. But um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Qualtrics just because um, it, it's, it's a very, very powerful platform. So at my tabling events, I always have a QR code. Um, and so before a student is able to get that, you know, free cup of coffee, maybe free bagel, or maybe spin the wheel. Um, some, some people like to do, you know, spin the wheel and win a raffle prize um, as a tabling event, but they just need to fill out a simple survey. So here I have, you know, full name, email, and I pose a question, are you aware of resources available to you as a transfer student, right? So this simple survey, allows me to actually get a lot of information. One, I get a student's full name and email address, which I can now add to my email marketing campaigns, right? But I also get um, some information as to whether they're aware of tr transfer resources on campus. So what's nice about Qualtrics is I can automatically go into the data and Qualtrics will manipulate it into charts for me. So you can see that um, this is um, <clears throat> kind of a donut chart showing on the screen. This is done through Qualtrics and I can break down the data very easily and see, okay, you know, 57%, about roughly 57% of our students are aware of resources for transfer students. However, 42%, which is a substantial amount, um, are not aware of resources available as transfer students. So to me, that's a red flag. And to me, um, that's an opportunity to start creating another drip campaign, create another initiative. Um, and now I have the email addresses of these students uh, to utilize, to import into my MailChimp software um, and start creating um, automated campaigns for them. You know, this might be targeted towards if we're having, um, you know, if OCSI, Orientation Commuter Student Involvement, is hosting an event, right? That's going to go to this group of people, right? Um, any, you know, resources or seminars that the university is hosting, I'm going to make sure to include that and send to this group of people. So this is very, very valuable data that you can get um, from tabling. One, you're boosting your presence on campus, you know, making transfer students aware that they have a voice, but also this is very, very important to collect data. And then finally, um, I want to talk to you about um, this newer initiative that I've created, uh, which is an online network for transfer students and alumni. And this is um, kind of my approach to maintaining post-graduation engagement within the transfer community. And so there are a lot of different ways, you know, I've done, you know, various research on, on how to do this, but the best way that I've found is to create, uh, create a LinkedIn page, all right? And this is this is a free service. You can create a LinkedIn group uh, for for your specific transfer initiative, or you know, just for transfer students at your institution. Um, but this is nice because what what happens is I have my members from Tau Sigma join this group, um, and then you know we have you know different if there's a different if a job opportunity is in the area, um, or you know maybe there's some sort of announcement that relates to alumni, and um, we'll post it in the group. And it allows you to engage um, with, you know, alumni that are, you know, that have graduated that are all over the globe now. But also, it kind of solidifies the transfer community because um, what's what very easily happens is between, you know, transfer leaders, especially with student leaders, is um, someone will create initiatives, and then once a new student leader comes in place, the initiatives will kind of fade away or or kind of um, just slowly, you know, fade out. And so having this LinkedIn group or having some sort of group that allows transfer students to um, maintain connections um, after they graduate is, is something that's very, very powerful. And I also like 
the LinkedIn group because it allows me to get statistics on um, various majors that students are going into, various jobs that students are going into. So we're able to relay that back to um, our transfer students on campus and say, hey, you know, through this initiative, um, these people were able to secure jobs at um, banks. These people were able to secure jobs um, at top marketing firms in New York, right? Um, and so it, it also provides some opportunity for networking um, and, and just a sense of, of community outside of the, the university. So I want to thank you. Um, I want to thank you for listening to this presentation. And um, what, what I really want you to take away from it is um, you know, whether your metric is, um, you know, bridging, bridging the distant community or whether your metric is kind of creating or boosting engagement um, for transfer students, the, the best way to do it is, is with data. I was able to grow my engagement rates this past year by 25% an um, in increase in show to, to various events, um, to our general body meetings. Um, and that's through using targeted newsletter tactics, through tabling events and collecting data. And um, we've had so much, um, you know, so much growth with our with our LinkedIn page. Um, it was it was a really big success. And so I highly encourage whether you're a student leader or a faculty member to start creating some sort of, of network if you don't already have that's going to connect transfer student alum um, with current students at the university. Uh, if you are a you know a faculty member or a, tra a transfer student leader here on campus, I encourage you to connect with me on LinkedIn as well. I would you know I would love to connect with you further. Um, but it, you know that's that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much, Cam. That was that was a wonderful presentation, and we have some follow up questions for you if you don't mind. Um, there we go. Um, fantastic job. Uh, we had somebody ask what subscription you have through MailChimp. If you know what's so, that. what's nice about MailChimp is it's completely free. Now there are packages that you can um, subscribe to, and if you want to go on on more of a of a paid plan. Um, if you depending on how many users you're actually going to be utilizing, but you know, we have a lot of a lot of transfer users. And so far, I've never had to upgrade to the paid plan, which is nice. So MailChimp, all that functionality with the analytics, you know, with the with the tracking of metrics, that's all free, which is um, which is why I'm a huge advocate of it. And that's and that goes for, you know, a, there's a lot of other um, you know, kind of newsletter software. There's constant contact, which does the same thing, but um, MailChimp is definitely what I would recommend. That's awesome. Thank you so much. The second question about emails and email campaigns. Um, what are your thoughts around the notion that, quote, students don't read email or that they stop reading at the third line? What is your experience with that? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. And I originally, before I, I started sending out news letters, I, I was just doing, you know, plain emails and I was not getting any responses. And so with my newsletters, I try to make them engaging. I use visuals, you know, immediately before there's even text, there's a big visual, there's an image of students, there's something that's going to grab the attention of the student. Um, so these newsletters are built to be engaging and MailChimp is really good at helping you do that. They should be colorful, they should be, you know, graphic. So it doesn't seem like the student has to scroll through a big body of text, because that's very off putting for students, you know, scrolling through their emails. Um, there should be buttons that students can click on things and it's, you know, it's very apparent, you know, click here to register. Um, so, you know, less text and more visuals, more graphics definitely help. So it sounds like you, you focus on putting a lot of events. It sounds like we do. We, we mostly do. Yeah. The, the newsletters are mostly comprised of like various events that we're having um, various initiatives that students should show up to and take part in things like that. Fantastic. And our final question is who staffs your tabling events? That's a good question. So these tabling events are actually staffed by um, students in Tau Sigma. And so, um, or Tau Sigma or, you know, other transfer students that we open it up to, you know, if you want to come help out, work this tabling event, we open it up to them. So it's all student run. All of them um, are, are going to be staffed by, by students either in Tau Sigma or in the transfer community that we open it up to. All right. I think an advisor asked that question because it's hard to get uh, advisors to help table and also to get students if it's not paid generally, it sounds like. Um, uh, and, okay. and that also goes to, and I'm sorry, just to, to add on to that, that also goes to um, the idea, the sense that, you know, 
you it's it's very easy with a strong community if, if students want to be together students are all friends you know they want to table they want to you know sign up for things and take initiative and things like that it's very hard with a distant community to get people to sign up for things because it feels like work you know it doesn't there's no really benefit of it for them so the the, the benefit of it should be you know you're in this community they're your friends and you're doing it together fantastic so we're back to building community that is a theme of our panel today which is awesome um and we have one more question um, I'm going to condense it, I think. It sounds like when you ask students using your Qualtrics uh, for their email to sign up for the newsletter, that they put whichever email they decide to put, either their school or their personal, because you're giving them the choice. Is that correct? So, yes. Yeah, so I put in my Qualtrics, I always put University of Miami email. Some students okay. choose uh, not to listen to that. And, you know, it, there's it's just an empty field, so they can put in whatever they want. Um, but I always encourage them to put the University of Miami email. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, and this will be my final call for questions for Cam. You should read the chat. You've got a lot of kudos coming at you from the chat. Thank you, <laughs> and more. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Cam, for presenting today. Um, huge shout out again to Cam, to John, to Armando. Um, thank you so much for your time and your energy and your efforts in preparing for our panel. Um, here are some takeaways from the chat and from our conversation um, that I'll just sort of read through because um, I think it's useful to collect thoughts at the end of a panel like this. So first of all, mentoring is a great transfer tool um, and it's important to see yourself. So representation matters very much throughout the mentoring process. Student voice is key to getting colleges and universities to highlight uh, and provide key services throughout the transfer pipeline, so be vocal. Staff, faculty, and institutions need to make transfer inclusivity and visibility a priority on campus, because with visibility comes an increased sense of belonging and opportunities to form community. Um, it's important for leaders on campus to understand the value of transfer students as they will channel resources into the system to invest in transfer success, which they understand leads to institutional strength. Uh, so I remember John specifically talking about making sure the numbers get to those deans or presidents or whoever um, to really highlight the uh, transfer population, which is large at most schools. And then finally, student leaders, put your work out there in order to find your people who are also doing the work with you. Building community is a great way to combat the challenges that come with addressing the challenges in the transfer pipeline, which again was also echoed by Cam. Um, in, in creating a Tau Sigma chapter where everyone wants to go hang out and table together. So next slide, please. Um, <laughs> without further ado, uh, just our final reminder again that tomorrow there will be another panel, same time, um, one o'clock to 2.30 central time. Uh, on transfer transitions. And that will be with Dr. Jackie uh, Durr and Dr. Marizel Garza. And then it is now time for said AirPod drawing. So don't leave, don't leave, because if you leave, we cannot give you said AirPods. Um, so Jeff is on the screen spinning the wheel. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't want to be the only thing between someone and a pair of AirPods. So let's see. We have all these names in a giant spinning wheel. Might take a few spins to find someone, but we will get to the winner. Can you all see the screen? We good? All right. The anticipation, I guess. Let's see. Is it going to be a celebration? Let's see. Is Andy Dean present? Can you come off mic or chat or something? If Andy Dean is present. I don't Going think once. he's here. Going twice. No Andy Dean. All right, let's try this again. While that spins, I just want to give a shout out to Madeline. If y'all can um, show your thanks for her in the chat or using your reaction buttons. Uh, she did a great job moderating and Holly Westbrook, do we have Holly Westbrook? Coming off mic or Holly in the Westbrook, chat. Are you here? 
don't think so. Okay. This is fun. Let's just keep doing this for a while. <laughs> Tara Lee Sands. I think Tara's here. Tara Lee, you could come off your mic and let us know. Oh, there we go. All right, Tara, all right, great. We will I'm follow here. up. There was a via... problem with my mic. Oh, no worries. We'll follow up with you via email. Um, awesome. thanks, for, thanks for everyone. Um, again, huge thanks to Armando, John, and Cam. It's our panelists, presenters, and Madeline uh leading us through our session and hope to see everyone here same time tomorrow see you all tomorrow